So please welcome to the stage the Carbon CEO, Joseph DeSimone, and Eric Lidicky from Adidas. He is the CMO and your moderator, Matthew Panzerino. When we first started with the idea of Futurecraft, it was to sort of guide us, to set us on a path. It's a mindset and it's a philosophy to try things. We're always bringing in new influences, new ideas, new collaborations. 3D printing, for example, was one of these new technologies that really had unlimited possibilities. You know, the initial problem was, okay, can we actually make a running shoe out of 3D printed material that really works and works well. So when we started thinking about doing 3D printing, we wanted to use liquids, because liquids give you the most flexibility in material design. I think of light as a chisel. Light triggers the solidification of the liquid, but oxygen inhibits it. That allows us to have the object grow. We're going to scale it with the best industrial partner in the business. We're able to deliver tens of thousands and moving to hundreds of thousands and into the tens of millions, you know, that's clear in front of us. We have this amazing opportunity to innovate the printing process, the liquid rising. And growing in that context can give you new design thoughts you've never had before and new performance capabilities that wouldn't be possible by traditional manufacturing. This three-dimensional mesh structure, it's a lattice, it's a matrix, it's a web of individual elements. Each one of those little elements is tuned specifically for a purpose. We can go in within every single cell and engineer that exact cell to do exactly what the consumer needs it to do just for them. That's fascinating, that's gonna change uh, how we create products and certainly how consumers experience products. And I think that's how we see something like Futurecraft 4D playing into the life of an athlete. All right. Excellent. All right. I'm going to contractually require sizzle videos whenever I go anywhere from now on. That was pretty good. Um, okay, excellent. So what we've got um, here is uh, a combination of a new type of printing process and then of course an application in shoes. Um, so Joe, let's start off, if you wouldn't mind, just describe uh, for us the process, the printing process that Carbon uses and why it's different from traditional 3D printing. So uh, we invented a process that's 100 to 1,000 times faster. We use light and oxygen to grow parts. We think of it as a, as a, a software controlled chemical reaction, about a third of our team is software. We have a digital twin of our process, the chemistry and physics all coming together. Uh, and what you saw there was basically this integration of hardware, software, and chemistry all coming together uh, to take a digital model, print it very fast, but do it out of the materials that had the properties to be final parts. Mm -hmm. 3D printing up to this most time has been with prototyping. In fact, it was called rapid prototyping. With the speed and the breakthrough in materials, this now ushers in a new era of 3D printing at scale, or what we call 3D manufacturing, which is, you put that in context, you know, the manufacturing world's a $12 trillion marketplace. 1.1 trillion of that is polymeric products, and 30% of that is injection molded. 330 billion, mm -hmm. injection molded. Yeah. But that's all made out of the analog process of you know, cutting a cavity in metal, heating up a plastic, melting it, filling the cavity, cooling it down, and pulling the parts out. It's expensive and it's time consuming. And it slows down product teams. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you, the product development cycle is normally you design it, you prototype it, you tool it, you produce it, it can take 18 months. Right. And whether you're designing autonomous vehicles or running shoes, that slows down. Yeah. We cut out the two middle steps, we disintermediate the process. It's design on the means of production. And it collapses product development cycles, allows companies, arguably the economy, to go much faster because you can do things at, at the speed of design. Right. And so the midsole that um, I have in my shoes here, I'm just stunting at this point, but I have in my shoes here, you have some midsoles there. Um, those are production ready. And it, it, was that the attractive part that you saw when the partnership with Carbon came up? Yeah, I think th we, we saw it more as a, there's a, a solution to an a, a answer to an end. So the, 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 the thing we're always trying to solve is what does the athlete need? What does the consumer need? What is the end use case that we can use? And what we see here is all the things Joe just talked about, which is amazing. But the applications 
are limitless when we talk about how we help athletes in their game. You know, because you can have, you can customize this down to the thousandths of a millimeter. You can look at, um, you know, individual product down to lot size ones. So I can, I can outfit a, a team of any any sport in individual products if we wanted to based upon the. And by lot size one, you mean person to person. Person to person. So yeah. the way you wear the shoe, the way Joe wears the shoe, they look the same, but they can be customized based upon your body weight, based upon your sport, based upon your 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 strikes. You know, as far as your foot strike, your your heel strike. Um, so it, it's unbelievable. On top of that, let's be honest, 80% of the footwear we wear is just for looking good in. Mm -hmm. Like you guys look great in those shoes, by the way. <laughs> so, Thanks. Yeah. Um, so then, then it comes down to it allows us to play with looks that we quite honestly couldn't have imagined before. Like the the lattice structure versus the shoe I have on, which is more a traditional construction, mm -hmm. is night and day from what we can what we can do and what we can do to offer to the consumers a, a brand bonus, new look. But, and so this this is a typical midsole, like in those in the polymer material, um, and the lattice here. It's all just extruded right out of the material, correct? With light. Yeah. Light, I think a light is our chisel. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> that can craft these complex geometries. And then the design work is uh, computational, right? So you say, hey, these are the properties I want this midsole to have. And you go about making sure that those properties exist and then um, extrude it. Yeah. So we basically have built these cloud-based software tools, finite element analysis tools that allow a, take a primitive CAD and then we have built a library of lattices in the cloud that have different unit cells, different strut length, different strut thickness, different materials. And the software can autonomously put these lattices together. And the user can define the primitive CAD. And then they ask what mechanical properties they need in different regions. And the software can populate that. And then we can send it to a printability module in the cloud, run a simulation of our process to see how fast it will go, see if any stresses develop. And it can go through an iterative loop. And then when we print it, it prints out exactly the way people want. Got it. And so let's talk about some of the other benefits. Like the benefits for Adidas go beyond just the design of the shoe and the fact that it can be produced to like one to one spec, but also uh, in materials usage, right? Mm -hmm. You use less materials? Yeah, ultimately, we're, we're still you know, ramping, ramping the innovation, I believe. So as we look at it, absolutely, it will be faster, it'll be um, more limited materials, it will be, you know, pr ideally, we'll, you know, the vision here is to be able to print on demand. Mm -hmm. So you can take it off of warehouse, you don't have to hold inventory, you don't have to, you can, hey, we run out of, we run out of um, size nines in New York, Fifth Avenue, and we print them in Atlanta and ship them in there in, in a 24 hour period. You know, so it's, it's on demand, and right now we make most of our product out of Asia, mm -hmm. and we put it on a boat or a plane, and we ship it over across the, across the ocean to deliver to Fifth Avenue, and right. it's a slow, as, as Joe said, takes six, sometimes longer months to produce. And then Atlanta factories, that one of your prototype speed factories. Yeah, we have a right? speed factory in Atlanta that we've just opened up that we're, we're, we're prototyping these things. We want to be closer to it. So instead of having a, you know, some sort of um, micro distribution centers in Jersey, we can have a micro factory in Jersey right. where you can, you can print on demand, which is, opens up all sorts of opportunities, both for the athlete, because we can at the same time take that to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So Tokyo Games 2020, we can have a micro factory there that's customizing for track and field athletes based upon you know how the how the surface is or how the weather is or, or how the different conditions are. So the right. the, the, the the use cases are limitless, r virtually limitless. This disrupts everything. Mm -hmm. And then uh, talk a little bit about uh, sustainability. So. In addition to obviously being able to, to subtract material you don't need, uh, be the lattices and customize, um, you've also got a, a midsole there that looks a little different from this. So explain yeah. what's different about that. <clears throat> so what's cool about it, you know, bringing all the mathematics together, all the engineering, the material scientists, the software, you can now start to think about, well, how do I make this shoe lighter and still perform properly? Right? And you know, mechanical engineers have been taunting all of us about lattices for decades, but you couldn't make these things. Now with, with our technology, you can not only make it, you can make it out of materials, got the properties, and make it quickly, so economically. So we talk about digital sustainability. These shoes can be substantially dematerialized. You know, we think about the hierarchy of sustainability, going into and removing, you know, re making materials lightweight but high strength and mm -hmm. performing. So breakthrough in materials, a stiffer material with the same energy recovery, we can take, you know, 100 grams out of these shoes. Right, so then you can dematerialize it. The yeah, ultimate sustainability is not even use the material in the first use place. Use less to begin with. Yeah. Then, in fact, uh, you know, the next resin, uh, the one I'm holding here, this is derived 43 whey percent derived from corn. 
bio-based feedstocks, renewable feedstocks. That's another example of sustainability going in those directions. The resin after that will be fully recyclable. With 3D, look, 3D printing is gonna be big. Our, we are so committed as a purpose-led organization to environmental stewardship. We're inventing resins that can be totally recyclable. The resin after this, after um, its use in the marketplace, we can convert those materials back to liquids and, and print them again. So that kind of recyclability is enabled by breakthroughs in material science, breakthroughs in, in manufacturing, and then you start thinking about, so okay, so we've dematerialized it, we got renewable feedstocks, we got truly recyclable resins, and then you start thinking about the supply chain, the ability of, you know, especially in the automotive industry and all the other sectors we work in, there's so many warehouses storing inventory tens of billions of dollars of inventory around the world in air-conditioned buildings for decades just holding product, whether it's the automotive industry, uh, other consumer industries, the medical industry, and having on-demand a warehouse in the cloud, local for local production can completely disrupt supply chain. Thomas Friedman said in one of his latest books that 2% of the GDP is in delivery trucks <laughs> at any given time. And so to be able to disrupt that and think about you know, global impact. Yeah. Um, so the design process, you, you talked about it a little bit earlier, but I'd like to uh, kind of unspool that a bit. I just find it fascinating. So as you mentioned, the typical design process was like, hey, we start with a sketch, we start with a model, you design a shoe, we say, hey, this is right for this market. Um, and then you got to go into the process of saying, okay, well, that's nice, but how can we actually make this? Mm. Then you have to order molds, get the molds made, test the molds, yep. figure out what's wrong with them, remake the molds, and then inject mold, and then get prototypes. And that whole cycle takes months. It, you know, As you mentioned, like sometimes a year, 18 months, right? Yep. Um, so what's the collapse of the design process? What do you think that'll lead to? Because uh, when you're talking about somebody being able to design on the means of production and say, I want this, this kind of uh, material, I want this kind of properties, uh, and then be able to see those results on a production-ready shoe right away, what does that open up for Adidas? Well, I think design by nature is, is, is seen as a right brain activity for the most part. And I think what we, what we start to introduce now is left brain data-driven design. And I think the, the two can marry nicely. We're not, we're not trying to say one's better than the other, but they inform each other. So what we have here, and we've got a perfect use case in front of you with, with Joe's team, who these, these guys are very much data-driven. And then when we put our designers in the room with them, magic happens. Because it's, it's how do we use the data-driven. And in this, in this use case we have, we took you know, 10 years plus, maybe 20 years of, of science that we had on foot strikes and running and how runners run and where the impact zones are and what we need to design into it from a data standpoint and then let the creatives take over but once we already had that and what you can do now is you can design most of this through um through ai and then the, and then just let the, the designers with the aesthetic come on the outside so what you see on the profile of the shoe mm -hmm. but the inside can all be done fundamentally based upon the the the, inst the instructions we give it, whether it be on an on a, on a individual basis or whether it be like the best runnings you ever made, give us all the data on all the runnings you've ever had, which we have from laboratory results. So it really informs that. And then as you, as you look at downstream, if you go right to prototype, if you, you don't have to go CAD drawing, you don't have to then send that over to a, a, a factory um, office that then can make a prototype then to send it back to us. We usually typically go two, three rounds of product reviews to tweak designs and make sure they're performing well. We can do that right on a, on a single, in a single physical location, but also in a, in the course of a day, you can, you can get something back in and start testing it immediately. So it's, again, it, it, I can't put a number on it, but it revolutionizes how things are made. Right, and it seems, I mean, you know, obviously this is an ideal way to start. I'm, I'm a little biased, I love shoes, but it seems like an ideal way to start. It's a, it's a huge mass market, um, opportunity to say like, hey, we're you know, you know, innovating with carbon, we're creating this new design, but it certainly seems like it has implications for all of manufacturing beyond you know, just the just midsoles of shoes to start off with. Um, what, what are some other areas that you've been working in that you found some really great success in terms of differentiating, say, hey, we're gonna extrude this part and give it to you versus what you've been doing, what's been, how you've been getting your parts so far? So the two areas that we thought were killer apps for us, one was running shoes and an amazing partnership with uh, Adidas. Uh, the other is dental. And you know, half our printers going out this year are going into the dental marketplace. And so it's a subscription model on the hardware. We sell resins. We got a half dozen different resins in the dental marketplace. They range from making dental models for making 
you know, crown and bridge fits, you know, for going into the dentist's office, but also getting the thermoforming aligners. Think about Invisalign and, you know, a lot of people coming into that space. But we now also have the world's first 3D printed, FDA approved dentures. Denture bases, denture teeth, printed, put, assembled. And what's cool about that is we're making those at scale and they're five to 10 times cheaper than the 100 year old milling process that people have been using forever to make dentures. You know, there's 60 million Americans that cannot afford dentures. They're not reimbursed by insurance. And having, you know, the ability, the dignity to smile, eat properly, speak properly, you know, oral health is tied to coronary disease. You know, it's, it's hugely gratifying for us to be able to bring cost effective super solutions to uh, people for health care. So that's just the beginning. We've got many other projects coming along with uh, uh, you know, a big partnership with J&J, &J, uh, products in a surgical orthopedic space, uh, all sorts of examples in uh, surgical drill guides and the like. Automotive is a huge market, you know, the big chunk of the injection molding market. So you think about how much products, how many product design it goes into making all the brackets and, and the likes in cars. For example, you take autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. When you go from level one autonomy in a car to level four autonomy, increasingly autonomous, you need an 8x increase in the number of sensors. You go from two miles a wire in a car to 12 miles a wire. You need brackets, you need sensors, you need electrical connectors. All those things are injection molding, or injection molded. And all those things take months to get, and expensive, and it slows down product teams. We are powering just about every autonomous vehicle company out there, every EV company out there, and we're dramatically uh, collapsing the product development cycle, speeding their ability to innovate. So it's really, it's a digital tool. It's taking analog injection molding, which is slow. We've built in all these time, all our programs are slowed down because of injection molding. We now allow people to design on the means of production. Mm -hmm. It's digital, it's taking injection molding to a digital process and allows product teams to go much, much faster. And that cyclical nature of that design process, you know, that you're producing, you're, or you're designing, you're producing, you're seeing it. Um, and I noticed there's a little QR code on, on this midsole. So like working with Adidas, like how does, how does that feedback loop help? Because I, I, previously, you know, you injection mold, you number the mold, you sort of know, you know, oh, hey, this came from that mold, but you don't know what the weather was like in, mm. you know, in China on that day when they, when they uh, injected it. So how does it help to have that data feedback loop uh, in terms of producing, designing, um, testing, and that sort of thing? Joe, why don't you handle that from the manufacturing? I can talk about it from an app. Yeah. So the idea of, you know, when you, when, you, when you don't have a QR code on a part, you don't know, you know, it's just one of tens of thousands of parts, and you don't know what their, really their story is. For example, so think about a uh, recalling a car. Uh, when there's a when there's a part breaking on a car, right? They have to recall all you know 30,000 of those vehicles or 80,000 because they don't know the origin of the of where that came from. But in a data centric world and if in a digital world where everything is marked, you can look at the data. Maybe you had a bad lot of resin and now you only have to recall 1,200 cars, right? So the impact of digital in digital manufacturing really changes the whole business model. The ability to authenticate parts, now tying this together so that, you know, that's an authentic BMW replacement part on your car. And how does one ensure that the properties and the performance and meets specification? Medical devices is probably the, you know, one of the biggest ones. And, and you know, the FDA is gonna wanna know that that part made digitally was made to spec. And, and the ability of having, you know, uh, uh, printers that are tied to the cloud, right, that are spewing data with serialized parts, traceable parts, links all that data with the part. So they know what polymer was used, what printer was used to print it, what day, what factory, what Everything's inch on the square floor, et cetera. Everything's locked down. And so from our standpoint, we're printing in America, we're printing in, in, in Europe, and we're printing in Asia. And we just need to have more of those data and say, what were the, what were the benefits, what were the limitations of each of the prints at what time, and we can, we can then troubleshoot. And as you scale innovation, troubleshooting's name of the game. You've got to stay agile and be able to adjust. So I can only concur what, what Joe's saying. He's, he's the... He's the um, the guru on this topic, but I mean, we're just using the benefits of it because it's now, again, uh, you can look at what factory, what day, where, and what went wrong in that isolated incident um, for what sport. You can apply it back to the consumer and how they use it. 
I, I, I'll just add, Eric's being kind here. <laughs> the, these are these partnerships. Uh, you know, this is for us. You know, it's a subscription model on our hardware. It's, it's not a transactional sale. So we have partnerships. Our team gets to work with his team, yeah. and it's amazing. They got amazing material scientists. They got amazing designers. This calling all creators brand. They don't suffer from the non-invented here attitude. That opens up a collaboration space for us. Uh, that is, it's really been amazing to allow us to work together. So. And, and that's been the key. I mean, a lot of people say, well, why did you get lucky enough to work with Carbon? It's like, we found each other. Mm -hmm. We found each other because we both have a disruption mindset where we want to we wanna, we wanna create the new and, and, um, and, and look at how we can disrupt the status quo. It's just uh, drilling something specific because I'm, I'm genuinely curious about how this scales. I know you're a sneakerhead, so yeah, well, for those <laughs> of you out there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, unfortunately, a little too much of one. But um, in terms of one to one, so like you're talking about, like the, obviously the capabilities seem uh, tailor made to be able to say, hey, you know, your foot works this way, your body works yep. this way, your strike works this way. So how does the average consumer, how do you get that, scale that to the average consumer? How do you say, this is your data set, yep. not just a generic data set we own, but this is your data set. How do you collect that? How do you uh, uh, and, match and them to a let's, shoe? Let's be honest. We make, I don't know, close to 500 million pairs of shoes a year. So I, I don't, I'm not sure this will ever go to 500 million. We can, we can scale it as much as we can. From an athlete standpoint, it's very important. So we have something called athlete services. So athletes are always looking for um, <coughs> something that's going to fit them. Everybody has different feet. Everybody has different ways they walk, they perform, they run, they play basketball, whatever the sport may be. And I think you always have to drill into how you make um, the foot become something that's a, that's, that's, that's a performance vehicle for the athlete, right? And how do you make the shoe do what it needs to do and nothing more? So the more minimal, the more, the more supportive, whatever we need to do for those athletes, that's what we've, and those have been customized with teams of cobblers literally making a shoe for these athletes. We don't need to do that anymore, this technology. So that's going to be a real game changer. But that's the tip of the pyramid. As you come down from there, I think you get more into how does this affect um, the, the culture of sport and, people, and the look of sport and how things go into a more technical vehicle and, and how things become more, more um, uh, consumed by consumers every day like us on, on the street. I think that gets interesting. Are they interested in you know, individualized, customized products? No, probably not. But the potential is there if we want to. What might be more interesting is the third thing, which is, the sustainability that Joe talked about a second ago, I think we can make now with this innovation, with these resins, we can make a, an upper and a bottom um, out of the same material. So what that <coughs> would allow us then is you can take one of your 500 pairs of shoes and you can take it to oh, a- Don't out me like that. That's <laughs> really rude. You can take it to Adidas or someplace <laughs> else and have it ground down uh -huh. and remade into a new pair of shoes just for you. And that gets really interesting because Traditional constructions don't allow for that because you've got rubber, you've got, you've got EVA, you've got different materials, you've got you know, different compounds. Here you can, you can actually sync up the compounds from the upper and the bottom, make it one TPU-based product. <laughs> and you, it allows you to remove glue, right? It allows you to improve everything. structural it, it, security. You make it as a unit, but now you can either have a, have a product that gets ground into a new product. Mm -hmm. You can then RFID that product that then you would have the ability to tell a story of what the previous generations of that product, where it came from. Mm -hmm. Could be your fifth generation shoe. Right. Could be a shoe that Elon Musk used to own. Mm -hmm. And you would have that story tagged into it through, you know, however you do. So it's, it, it just opens up all sorts of opportunities that we haven't begun to, you know, explore or, or discuss yet. But the use cases are clear just on the, just on the benefit of manufacturing. Cool. Um, we got a, a couple minutes left, so indulge me in a couple of sneakerhead questions. So one, um, what's the scalability of this look like in terms of near term? Because the, the shoes, the 40 shoes yep. that have been out so far, I'm very jealous of the white pair, but the 40 shoes that have been out so far have uh, been very hard to get. You know, huge, huge more, more limited, More that. limited than Kanye. More, yeah, more limited than Kanye, yeah. right. So how, how, soon is, how soon are we going to look at scale where people can find these on the shelves? Well, right now, let's say we, we've launched units of hundreds <laughs> in, in the market. We'll get into thousands by the end of the year. Um, and within two years, we'll be talking millions. Okay. And then uh, my second question, is Kanye related? Funny you should mention. Uh, this week, he said that he was talking to you, uh, name dropped you on a radio station about possibly designing Adidas entire basketball unit. Do you want to break some news? <laughs> I, 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 I will let Kanye speak for Kanye. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but I think, listen, we... we it's the same cultural reason why we went in with Joe and Carbon to try kind of disrupt the, the, the methodology of how you manufacture. It's the same thing we're doing with Kanye. Let's just 
let's challenge convention. And if Kanye's got some ideas, I'll be the first one to, to listen because I think the guy's uh, a creative uh, genius and I think he's got a lot to offer in how he creates. I mean, look what he did with music this year. Mm -hmm. Five albums in five weeks. Right. It, it's pretty impressive what he can do from a from an output standpoint, and he's challenging us to think differently mm -hmm. and to do things differently. And he, by the way, wants to get his hands on on some carbon printers ASAP. So, yeah, uh, I bet. I would love to see some Yeezys with 40 souls. I'm, I'm all in. So, excellent. Thank you both very much. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time. You right. bet. And Thanks, thank you for Brian. watching. Thank you.